morning, my neighbor. Please stand with me. Oh 
I know that I, I don't do the shuffle, I don't do whatever dance they do now, but I can toy, coin toss, I guess, if they make a touchdown. <laughs> but looking ahead to the 4th of February, no ball game scheduled, we're going to be snow tubing the older youth. We're going to do an evening snow tubing between 5 and 7. It'll be a perfect north. Uh, the cost is $25 per tuber. And we'd love to have you come join us. It's for um, the youth, eight, grade six and up, and their families. In the past, we've had a great time, and feel free to join in on the fun. There are sign-ups because we do get a group rate, and we have to know ahead of time who's going to be there. So if you would be willing to sign up, I'll have waivers next week that we'll need to fill out, and hope to have a great time at Perfect North. Thank you. That's all the updates we have. Have a blessed day. Thanks, Bill. Hey, I want to introduce a, uh, a speaker from the Brown County Pregnancy Resource Center who has come to share some updates with us. I invited uh, them to come and, and, and the speaker to come and Tamara Plymesser, the, the director, was planning to come. She is ill today, and so last night at the 11th hour, she called Julie Kibler, who is here to share an update, and so I'll welcome Julie to come. And as she comes, I'll let you know today is uh, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, and she'll say a little bit more about that. Julie, will you come and share, and will you welcome her as she comes? that we want to portray from the Pregnancy Resource Center. So as he said, my name is Julie Kibler. I am the abortion recovery consultant for the Pregnancy Resource Center, a place of hope. Um, and 50 years ago today, on January 22nd, 1973, Roe v. Wade made abortion legal in the United States for any reason and at any point in the pregnancy. For those 50 years, over 64 million babies have lost their lives to abortion. As of 9 p.m. last night, the exact number was 64,494,645. And that's in the United States alone. There have been over 1 billion worldwide. Uh, in 20, 2021, the most recent statistic from the Ohio Department of Health states that there were 21,813 abortions in Ohio. 24 of those were in Brown County, and two by women who live in Hamersville. My question is, what am I, as a Christian, to do about this? And I believe the answer is in this verse from Proverbs. Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. That's Proverbs 24, 11 through 12, NLT. Now we witnessed the historic overturning of the tragic Roe versus Wade decision on June 24th of last year. And our battle is not over. This decision is now turned over to the states. Abortion is still legal in many states, even in Ohio, where the heartbeat bill is being held up in court. Babies are still dying, and women are still living with this tragic decision. We are seeing the effect of this decision at our local PRC. In 2021, we saw a total of 385 clients. But last year, from January to June, before the decision, we saw 180 clients. After the decision from July to December, we saw 362 for a total of 542 for the year. And that's a 40% increase. With this increase, our needs are greater than ever. The PRC work to rescue the unborn children of our county every day. And not just the babies, but also their mothers, fathers, and extended families. Because abortion does not just affect the baby and the mother, but many others often for generations. 
The choice to have an abortion changes a woman's life, and we want to be there for her when she realizes what she has done. We want her to know that she is loved and forgiven regardless of the decision she has made. This year, our 30th year, by the way, our theme is 1 Corinthians 15, 58, which says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. As Christians, we need to be steadfast and immovable on the topic of abortion. On January 13, 1984, President Ronald Reagan proclaimed January 22nd as National Sanctity of Human Life Day, as that was the 11th anniversary of Roe vs. Wade. President Reagan was a strong anti-abortion advocate, and he penned these words. We are poorer, not simply for lives not led and for contributions not made, but also for the erosion of our sense of the worth and dignity of every individual. To diminish the value of one category of human life is to diminish us all. Slavery, which treated blacks as something less than human, to be bought and sold if convenient, cheapened human life and mocked our dedication to the freedom and equality of all men and women. Can we say that abortion, which treats the unborn as something less than human, to be destroyed if convenient, will be less corrosive to the values we hold dear? As the abortion recovery consultant, and being someone who has had a past abortion, I know all too well the regret, pain, and torment that that decision has caused. It took me 20 years to come to terms with what I had done and caused me to have symptoms of post-abortion syndrome. I had a client who, in her 60s, reached out to try to get forgiveness and peace after 40 years of holding in the secret. I even had a couple of fathers reach out to me, wanting me to understand that this pain is not just for the mothers. They were haunted by aiding in past abortions of their own children. Many women and men I've talked to have had nightmares, flashbacks, suicidal thoughts, depression, and substance abuse. The Pregnancy Resource Center sees clients who are struggling with an unplanned pregnancy all the time. One client we saw was 17 years old when she found out that she was pregnant. Her parents insisted that she get an abortion, even made an appointment for her and refused to listen to her. They said she was too young and immature to take care of a baby. A couple days before her appointment, she drove by the PRC and copied down our phone number and called to make an appointment for the next day. Thankfully, the information she received from us allowed her to stand up to her parents, and she had her baby. We had another 17-year-old client who found out she was expecting. She had big plans for her life. She played sports that in her senior year could offer her a chance at college scholarships. She had plans that would have to change with a baby on the way. She came into the center with her father to talk about her options, and her father sat there in tears, and he finally said, it's her life, it's her choice. And she did not make the choice to keep her baby. As I mentioned earlier, we have seen a large increase in clients this past year. We offer lots of services which are free, but our clients are expected to earn what they receive, and we do this for three reasons. An earned item holds more value, an earned item helps them maintain their self-esteem, and an earned item helps them learn much needed parenting skills since many of our clients do not have good parenting role models. Some of our services include pregnancy tests, parenting classes, car seat programs, crib award programs, newborn layettes. We give out lots of material goods such as diapers, wipes, clothing, formula, bottles, pretty much anything that has to do with a baby that gets donated into the center, we give back out. And we really rely on our supporters to do the work that we do. We rely on donations of material goods that our clients use. We rely financially on donations from churches like yours who support us. We also have fundraisers and events every year to help bring in funding. We rely on volunteers to help us serve our clients in lots of different ways. We also rely on your prayers, especially when a client chooses to have an abortion, even after hearing other options. Those decisions weigh heavily on us, and your prayers are certainly felt when we feel defeated. Thank you for your time today, and if you have any questions or would like to learn more about volunteering, please see me in the foyer after the service. Thank you. All right, join me in thanking Julie.
be, uh, we're blessed to have uh, uh, the wonderful organization, the Brown County Pregnancy Resource Center, here in, in our community, and and uh, you know, just in, in very practical, and wonderful ways, they are uh, you know just letting people know that you know God values every every life, including the life of, of unborn children, and then you know proclaim the, the power and, and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to them as well, the power of the Lord to help them, uh, you know, to live out that decision to keep the child and the grace of the Lord to, you know, to, for forgiveness for, for any that have, you know, made decisions that they're regretting and so forth. Just a, just a wonderful organization of folks and and uh, just glad that, uh, I think you would agree with me, glad that we can partner with them. There's a specific way today that you can, you can carry that out and as in the past, you probably participated in it you can take a uh, one of the empty baby bottles that we're offering and it's part of a program that they entitle change to change lives and uh, as you know you, you can take the baby bottle home fill it with your change bring it back here we'll get it to them or you can take it yourself directly to the pregnancy resource center and drop that off that helps them with their funding. I, I took ours home early, and at least I filled this up and brought it down and sent it with Julie. In fact, I'm gonna give it to you now before I forget, because I'm gonna leave this here, and then you'll go home without it. You'll go back to the PRC without it. So I hope, hope you'll uh, do the same. Also wanna let you know that that through your giving to our, uh, in our general offering, uh, part of that money we're using to help support the Pregnancy Resource Center. And so uh, this week, a check for $1,000 will be mailed to them uh, for their ministry on behalf of our leadership team and you, the congregation. And so, uh, you know, we're glad again to partner with them in, in this in this effort. Uh, and so uh, uh, thank you for being here, Julie, just as uh, well done. We appreciate your presentation. And her husband, Jim, is with her as well. After the service, you can find them out in the narthex if you'd like to talk about how you could volunteer there or maybe some other things that they may need, different ways you can help. You can see Julie and, and she'll help you out with that information. Well, I want to invite you now, if you would, to, uh, to join me in prayer and uh, we have some needs to, to lift up and some ministries coming up this week that we want to, want to pray for as well. Well, Heavenly Father, uh, this, this morning, uh, we're, we're glad to be here together and and to worship you, and I'm thankful always each each day for others who have have chosen to commit this first part of their week to you to be here. Maybe this morning is more of a challenge than than other mornings to be here because of different road conditions and so forth. But Lord, you know our hearts. You know why we've come. We've come because we we love you. We want to honor you. We we desire to please you and lift up the name of your Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we just pray that uh, you would be well pleased, indeed be well pleased, and, and Lord, that because we've come together here today, uh, we would be allowing you the opportunity to have your good way in us, and not just in us, but through us as well. God, how might you want to use our lives in someone else's life? Maybe us being here today is a part of that. But certainly, Lord, uh, uh, you know, we just want to, to give you honor and praise. Father, we, we think of uh, different needs uh, connected to our congregation, some health needs. We think of Buck Blake, who has uh, pneumonia, is hospitalized at Claremont County Hospital. We uh, pray for Denise Patton, who's recovering from surgery. Dane Shannon, who's had such terrible headaches and just hard to even function. Lord, we pray for these persons uh, that your healing power would bear upon them. They would experience uh, more of your grace in their lives and they would know <coughs> that you love them dearly. Father, we pray for the ministry of the Pregnancy Resource Center. Uh, we just ask that you would continue to give them favor with uh, folks in our community and that you give power and grace through them for many to choose life for their little ones and find healing uh, even for themselves. Father, uh, we, we pray for the food pantry and God's table ministry will be functioning this Saturday. And uh, Lord, for those you would send our way, 
Would you help us to love them on behalf of your Son, Jesus Christ, and provide some wonderful practical help that is a sign of your love for them and ours as well. And now, Father, we, we pray for uh, a scripture reading that we'll uh, you know, get to enjoy together here in just a, a few minutes. And uh, Lord, we, we pray that you would awaken us from our slumber, so to speak. It's January. We haven't seen many sunny days. Maybe it's the first time the whole week that we've sat down for close to an hour and been still. Maybe our thoughts have, you know, just been, been clouded by other concerns, whatever it is. Maybe, maybe there's been a spiritual struggle going on and, and uh, Lord, we've been reaching out to you, but the heavens seem to be bouncing back our prayers. God, whatever it is, we pray that in these moments, you would waken us from our slumber connected to any of those things. God, would you awaken us to hear you speak to us and give us grace to take whatever step you lead us to take. We pray this in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. And well, before I begin to preach this sermon, I want to let you know about our website. Uh, if you've tried to log into it, you, you know that nothing happens. You get back some kind of an error code and that sort of thing. And we're still not there yet, are we, Samuel? Samuel's our media person. He's been working on this. It's, it's been a nightmare. Um, what they it, it tried, to, tried to do is you know, transition to a new domain name, the same website, and it's things are locked up for some reason. And so I'm confident this week that things will be resolved. And if any of you have the kind of skill that could possibly help us with that, please see us afterwards. We need to get that website up and going. But between now and then, I want you to know you can still see the services online by going directly to YouTube. Actually, what, what you have found on our website as far as being able to watch the services is a link to YouTube. So you go directly to YouTube and, and just search for MT Nevo UMC, still under that name, and it'll pull up our church. There are lots of Mount Nevos. So you can you type it in any other way, you're gonna to have to go through a whole list of Mount Nevos, but you'll find uh, our, our church's uh, uh, services on on that uh, on web on uh, YouTube under that that name. So, all right, thank you. Hey, today continue to preach in the series for the kingdom, and and just to remind you of, of what uh, uh, what we considered last week, and that is that Scripture tells us that the kingdom of God exists here uh, on earth. Not like the kinds of kingdoms that were represented by stone castles and kings and knights and, and, and the such. But uh, his kingdom exists here on earth. It, it, it exists in, in heaven for sure. Uh, and, and, but it's come to earth through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said these words. He said in Mark chapter 1, verse 13, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So God's kingdom has always existed. It will never end. Uh, and, and God's kingdom, uh, there in heaven, His sovereign authority is accepted. His will is obeyed. No rebellion is permitted. The kingdom of God exists in heaven, but it also exists here on earth. And it exists in, in uh, any person's life who acknowledges Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior by faith, and who willingly, humbly, has surrendered their life to Him. The kingdom of God exists here on earth through a person's life like I just described. But the kingdom of God is not flashy. It isn't. It's not flashy. You don't see it on advertised on jumbotrons in stadiums with 65,000 people sitting around like we do in football stadiums. You don't see it advertised that way. The kingdom of God here on earth doesn't rely on the fanfare of the world in order to be realized and to be seen. God brought his kingdom 
to earth in a low-key kind of way. Not to gain likes from the, a crowd, but to save the lost. That's, that's why God's kingdom has come in a low-key kind of way. We, we, you know, we just celebrated the uh, birth of Jesus Christ. Remember how it happened? Remember how God brought it about? Uh, first of all, God chose a, a Jewish girl from a small country town to be the mother of Jesus, his son. He didn't choose a princess. God chose to have a son born in a small rural village, the village of Bethlehem. You're with me, aren't you? He was born in the village of Bethlehem, not in the capital city of Jerusalem. God chose for Jesus to have uh, only a hay major for a crib, but not a special bed in a palace. God chose for the birth of his son to be announced by angels to shepherds. There you go. So you're, you got your track along with me here. It, it had it, the angels announced the message to shepherds, not to thousands of, of people in a large city. Then Jesus chose to reveal himself and his mission to 12 little known, unimpressive Jewish men, not to 12 well connected men of influence. The kingdom of God, I say all that to say, the kingdom of God isn't flashy. In fact, when Jesus, uh, the king of the kingdom of God, came to earth, he was and is the king of kings, but a veiled king. Not everybody saw it then, not everybody sees it now. He wore a crown, but it was a crown of thorns. He had an entourage with him for sure, but they were just fishermen and ordinary guys and the like. He had no place uh, and he had no palace. In fact, during his, his ministry years, he didn't even have a place to, of his own to lay his own head down every night. Uh, the kingdom of God isn't flashy, but Jesus brought the kingdom of God to earth in a low-key kind of way, and it exists here today in and through the lives of every person who has been saved and received by faith Jesus Christ as their Lord. They are Those who are saved are people who have chosen to come under his authority to say, Jesus, you are, are my king, and I, I choose to live under your authority. There are people who have come under his authority, and by his power, they work at putting themselves second and Jesus first. Now, Jesus first uh, mentality is counterintuitive to what the world says it takes to win at life, to be happy, to be successful, and all of that, that Jesus first is counterintuitive to all of that. But, but because it's true, because it's true that people have, who have put their faith in Jesus Christ have a Jesus first mentality, because that is true, we can identify the kingdom of God here on earth in and through the people who put Jesus first in practice. I mean, think about it. The kingdom of God here on earth. Think about that. I mean, absolutely amazing that it could be true. And it's worth, worthy of, you know, a top news headline. It's worthy of world recognition. But God's kingdom isn't recognized by people who choose not to believe in Jesus Christ and, and, and choose not to obey him. It, the kingdom of God isn't recognized by them. They, 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 they think that living for themselves today is all they have and they miss the fact that the kingdom of God exists all around them. In Mark chapter uh, 4 verse 11 Jesus said to his 12 disciples the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you but to those outside everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they may turn and be forgiven. And so, end quote. So Jesus told his disciples that many people were, you know, in the crowd, were not really listening to him. He knew that. Crowds gathered around him. He knew that many people gathered in the crowds were not really listening to him. They looked at him as just another guy. Another kind of leader that's, that's, you know, stood up and tried to get everybody's attention. And so as he knew that some people looked at him, listened to his words, and more or less just said, here's another guy saying, blah, 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 blah. That's it. 
Uh, he knew that people were more or less saying in their hearts, I don't know exactly what he's talking about, and I don't care enough to try to understand and ask more questions. They just weren't interested in Jesus or spiritual things. Jesus knew that. He, 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 they, they saw, he knew that they saw him but didn't perceive who he was. They knew that they heard him but didn't understand him. And therefore, because of their response to Jesus and his words, they had rendered themselves unable to believe, unable to repent, unable to be forgiven. Jesus knew that. They had rendered themselves unable to do that. It wasn't that they, they you know, God prevented them from ever believing and repenting. He just knew that they had rendered themselves unable to do so at that current state of heart and mind. Jesus spoke to the crowds about the kingdom of God in a way that gave them a choice. He spoke in parables so that they could not just say, sure, sounds good, I'll vote for that. It had to be a deeper response that he was looking for, a response from their, their hearts that, that said, you know, something to the effect, Lord, I believe you're speaking to me. That applies to me. I'm in need of repenting. I'm in need of believing. You know, I want to hear more. People that, would believe, that believed he brought the words of life to them. And that's why he spoke to the crowds in parables. So that if, if, in order for people to respond, they'd have to respond at that kind of level. You know, the words of Jesus aren't just uh, words. They're not. They're not just words. Uh, but we see them as just words until we figure out they're the words of the Son of God. Therefore, they are the words of life. Life, he speaks about life in relationship with him and how to gain it and how to live it. Jesus spoke those kinds of words. Well, today we're going to look at two parables Jesus told about the mystery of the kingdom of God. Let's follow along as I read from Mark chapter 4. I'll invite you to stand, please. If you're able, please stand as I read from Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 26. He also said this. He also said, this is what the king, kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain from the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all, of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke uh, the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. You may be seated. The parables, Jesus introduced both of these by saying the kingdom of God is like. First of all, he said the kingdom of God, in the first parable, the kingdom of God is like a man scattered seed on the ground. And he's referring, of course, to a farmer who's planting the crop. And, and, and the farmer, farmers want their crops to sprout. They want their crops to mature over a three or four month period of time. And then to yield enough to make it worth their time to have planted the crop. To yield, to make create a profit for them, a yield for them. And Jesus started with this parable by saying a farmer planted a crop and and uh, you know farmers do best practices back then and so you know people understood farming if they weren't farming themselves they knew people who were it was a common sight to see somebody planting seed and and so Jesus starts with something they know like that next he says he makes this point he said night and day whether he sleeps whether the farmer sleeps or gets up the seed sprouts and grows so he does not know how uh, you know, now we can explain uh, the, the process, can, can't we? We can explain the process they could not. Show me that next slide. Will you please show us that? 
So here's a, here's a picture of a bean seed in the ground, uh, sprouting, you know, germinating, it germinates and then it begins to sprout. You see a little tap root come out and then, you know, till it, till it pushes through above the ground. There's a lot going on below the ground before you ever see what's happening above the ground. And, and we know that it takes moisture, it takes certain soil temperature, it takes, you know, in order to germinate. And then after it germinates, then there's a root, then there's sprout, then it grows and on and on and on. In, in time, in the time of Jesus, people could not explain all of that. They could not explain all that. We can today, but you know what? People back then and people today are the same. We cannot create one seed. We cannot create one seed. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can observe, but we cannot create. God has created that seed, and the mystery of that seed growing is still there today like it was back then. But Jesus said, you know what? The soil, uh, all by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel is in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And so the, the, seed, the seed grew, in other words, and the farmer did not make it grow. The seed grew and the farmer didn't make it. It grew, it grew on its own. It, you know, so whether the farmer would sleep, it grew. Well, if he stayed up all night, it would still grow. The seed grew regardless, and the result was a big harvest. And Jesus said the kingdom of God is, is like that. It grows, though we don't understand everything about how it grows. Years come and go, the kingdom of God grows. Governments and nations come and go. The kingdom of God grows. Governments arise on the face of the earth that that uh, allow for you know, uh, people to worship freely. Other governments arise and still exist today that, that want to prevent people from worshiping and believing in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. The kingdom of God keeps growing. It keeps growing in, in any, you know, regardless of the circumstance. People you know, be keep believing in Jesus Christ and experience uh, you know, change life, new life, and we can see it. We can see it when a person comes to know Jesus Christ, and yet we don't know exactly everything that God did to bring it all about. We just get to see some of that. So in that regard, uh, the, the kingdom of God is like a seed hidden in the ground that grows and then keeps growing, but the complete result is a mystery until the harvest time, when it's all gathered in. And then we see the, the magnitude of it. So the total impact of God's kingdom is not clear to us now. It will be made clear to us in heaven when we see all those who have believed and been saved. But God grows his kingdom, but exactly how he does it is still a, a, a mystery to us. Second parable. Uh, Jesus said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? He said, it's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of garden plants. And the picture I have here of a mustard seed, just to remind you, you're probably familiar with it. If you do cooking, some recipes call for mustard seed. That gives you an idea of how, how big it is. It's not literally... The smallest of seeds, it isn't, but it's the smallest of, of grains raised for food. It was back then. It seems insignificant, and yet Jesus makes a point, but it can grow into this huge plant, this huge bush. So he, he makes the point of saying, like, what happens to the mustard seed? The kingdom of God on earth may seem insignificant. It may seem like no big deal, like there's no big impact to it. But the truth is, a few people put their faith in Jesus Christ and by, by His power begin to, to, you know, to live a, a Jesus-first life. Uh, you know, and, but the kingdom of, of, you know, it seems like, okay, that's, that's one person, that's two people. But the kingdom of God uh, in and, and through that person's life keeps growing. And then one more person is affected and and then one more 
and then the cumulative effect over the years through one person's life becomes a big deal uh, as the impact, the impact of that person's life keeps growing. So the kingdom of God, uh, according to these two parables, may appear to be, you know, uh, unseen, <coughs> but it keeps growing and it results in a big harvest. It also may appear to be small and, in, you know, uh, insignificant, but it has a big impact. <coughs> God sees to that. And it's somewhat of a mystery to us. I mean, we just don't completely un understand the significance of all that. But God is growing his kingdom here on earth, one person at a time. And what may seem small to us is a big deal. You know, it, it's interesting that Jesus used uh, seeds being planted to il illustrate the spiritual truth about God and his, ki his kingdom. And it, it's still an effective illustration today. By the way, please pull up that next picture if you would. Have you noticed the Pioneer Seed grain bins located just to the north of the church on 774? Have you noticed those? There's a picture from the corner of our parking lot looking at those grain bins. Dang, Becky Wallace uh, owned those. And they're the six tall seed bins. I talked with Denny yesterday to get the exact amount they hold. They hold 3,330 bushels each. You multiply that by six, totals 19,980 bushels of seed to be planted. So it means, I believe, all those hold. Now, most farmers around here plant around 50 pounds of soybeans per acre when they plant. And so that means that the seed from those six bins would plant 24,000 acres. What you see in those grain bins, the seed you see there will plant 24,000 acres. Now at the average yield of 55 bushels per acre, that the yield would be 1,320,000 bushels. All of that that started with 19,980 bushels. So 19,980 bushels within a three to four month period would produce 1,320,000 bushels. Can you get your head around that? We, we, we're used to it. We see, you know, we see stuff planted, we see stuff grow. We see, would you pile it all up together and consider how that works. And God has seen to it that it works that way. That small ends up turning into something big. That seed grows. And, and, and farmers don't have to stay up at night in order for that seed to grow. Farmers don't have to go out in the field and talk to their plants. You know, they plant the seed in the ground. Come on now, you can do it. Come on up out. You can make it up out of that ground. You, you can grow. You can produce a crop. They don't have to. Do the, if you see some a farmer doing it, please go pray with them, will you? They're having a hard time. They, they don't have to go out to the seed and say, come on, that way. You can grow this way. Don't go down. Don't go sideways. You grow that. They don't have to do any, any of that. They plant it, and it grows. And they harvest many times the bushels that they plant. 50 pounds of seed, I broke it down per acre, 50 pounds of seed planted per acre at 55 bushels an acre becomes 3,300 pounds in three to four months. God has created seed with the capacity to yield many times their weight from small to become big. He's created in his kingdom, small becomes big. His kingdom here on earth seems small, begins small. One life is, is changed by believing in Jesus Christ. One life is impacted. And yet that one life then begins to impact many others. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, then, you know, it, it, you may feel like, you know what, I'm just one person. 
There's so many, so many people on the face of the earth that are lost, they're not saved, and, and the task seems so big. There's so many just bent, seem to be bent on not believing, don't want to hear it, not interested, all that kind of thing. I'm just one person. I'm just one life. What impact can my life have for the kingdom of God? Well, your life lived for Jesus Christ and his kingdom uh, can have a huge impact. That's what Jesus said regarding the kingdom of God here on earth. It starts small and it keeps growing. And he chooses to grow it through the lives of other people who have believed in Jesus Christ. But it's hard to see the impact of that. Just like it's hard to see the fact that that, you know, those grain bands can produce, you know, a million plus bushels of grain. You don't, you, you, we never see that piled up together. You're never going to see, I'm never going to see the spiritual impact of being a part of the kingdom of God and God growing his kingdom through us. We're not going to see the total impact of that until we get to heaven and look out and if, if, if with spiritual eyes, God enables us to see the number of people that we had a contribution in by God's power, a contribution in helping to grow the kingdom of God results in individuals. And if we have any idea, if we can look out there and see the eyes of all those that we had a piece in, see, you know, coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll be beyond what we can, what we can imagine here on earth. I mean, you don't know. You don't yet know how many people that you will influence to believe in Jesus Christ and to be part of his kingdom growing here on earth. You don't yet know that. I don't either. I've referred to this story before, not in this sense, but I can't help but think back to it. <clears throat> Very personal to me. My, my parents, uh, neither one of them were Christians when I was growing up. They didn't, didn't have that Christian influence in my family, but I grew up in a time, uh, and, and in the early 60s when I was in preschool, that it was common, it was a popular thing, that you took your kids to Sunday school. Even if you didn't go to church, uh, you took your kids to Sunday school. My mom did that. She dropped my sister and I off uh, for Sunday school. Uh, I, I, I you know, remember that. She would only do that occasionally. But I remember going. And part of the reason I remember going is because of my preschool, Sunday school teacher. Her name was Mrs. Brown. You've heard me talk about her before. She was an older lady. She had perfectly white hair, just a beautiful head of white hair. And she was a, uh, just an older lady. And she was in that classroom with preschoolers all by herself. And uh, if, uh, my mom reminds me, as, as I know from our own children, when you have especially little boys, preschool age, good luck trying to get them to sit still. I mean, it just ain't going to happen, right? They just, they, they're just full of energy. They want to run, especially when they're together. Oh, good. Here's somebody else to play with. Let's go. You know? So I can only imagine what that preschool class was like for Mrs. Brown. And, uh, and, and uh, but I do remember this about her, that I remember her, specifically remember her reading us scripture and teaching us Bible songs to go along with that scripture. I still remember that today. And I sense this uncommon love of, of in her life. She wasn't my family member, but there was something special about her and the way she, you know, responded to us kids and because of that, years later, I could look back and see that God helped me to experience something that he would use to help bring me to faith in Jesus Christ. And that was this from Mrs. Brown and that class. The church was a good place to be. I didn't know I was getting that when I was a preschooler. But I tell you what. I, I got that because of her. Right now, there are people teaching children's church next door. And there, some of them are probably wondering, are these kids even listening to what I'm saying? Are they getting anything 
out of what's going on. But there, there they are. They're with those children and they're they're teaching them scripture and you know they're working with them. There they are, not knowing what's what's going on. But God's going to grow His kingdom from through lives like that. And so, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Brown was part of growing God's kingdom in the sense that people, uh, I eventually came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, uh, I came to know the Lord because I came to know the Lord and my mom came to know the Lord because she came to know the Lord. My sister came to know the Lord. My grandmother came to know the Lord. My sons came to know the Lord and I could go on and on and on. Mrs. Brown contributed to all of them entering the kingdom of God. She did. Never seeing the total impact. She, she, she never saw on this earth the total impact of all that. My mom did go to her some years later and say, you, you may not remember me. <coughs> but my son was in your preschool class and I want you to know that he came to know the Lord. And he's, he's uh, responding to a call to pastoral ministry. And then he's now pastoring a church. And her face just lit up with a smile. She was getting a glimpse. She was getting a glimpse of how God was growing his kingdom through her. Just a glimpse. If you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> you're part of the kingdom of God here on earth. He's working in and through your life to spread his kingdom here on earth. And your contribution may, may seem small, insignificant. You may be wondering, am I even making a real contribution for him? But if you're seeking after him in a small group, if you're seeking to serve, and maybe you're going to show up here on Saturday and be a part of one of those ministries, maybe you're, you're you know, a, a student at school, a teacher at school, and you are there at that school, and you're you're attuned to the fact that Jesus is first in your life. And so you, know, you see a friend in need and you're reaching out to them. You're praying for people. You're, you're encouraging them. Hey, listen, uh, the, the help I've found, you can find too. You know, here, here's, let me tell you about the Lord Jesus and what he's done in my life. All those kinds of things. You're part of, of, of his kingdom growing here on earth and your contribution is not small. It is not insignificant. It is bigger than you know because the harvest has not yet fully been realized yet. yet. But someday in heaven, we will know. We'll see the harvest. It'll be bigger than we can ever imagine. And so I want to encourage you, especially this time of year, then it just feel like I don't even want to leave the house sometimes. You know, it's just that sun has, doesn't shine very much. It's it's gloomy outside, and you know we're in that lull after Christmas where you know what do we have to look forward to, you know that kind of stuff. It's like ah, uh, you know, it, 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 is my life even making a difference? <coughs> Excuse me. I'll tell you, I encourage you keep living for the kingdom of God. Keep putting Jesus first in your life. Keep, keep working at that. It matters that day by day you're seeking after the Lord. You're making yourself available to Him. You're loving and caring about your family, your friends. You're, you're, you're pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ in a lot of different ways. Through the words you say, through the, the way you love and care for people. All of that. And God is growing His kingdom. It may not seem like it. But he is. He's growing his kingdom. <clears throat> That's the mystery, isn't it? That God is growing his kingdom through you and me in bigger ways than we can ever know. Keep up. Keep up the good work. Keep up. Don't, don't give up. The, the kingdom is still growing. It's still growing. And God wants to keep growing it through you and me. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, every one of us who knows Jesus, your Son, has been a part of the amazing thing you do through growing your kingdom here on earth. You use the lives of 
work through the lives of other people to help us to, to even begin to believe in Jesus. And you do the same with us. And, and one, one life at a time, Lord, you change the, the face of the earth by bringing more of your kingdom here. And so we say right now, we want that to be us. We want to, we want to be, <clears throat> be and continue to be part of growing your kingdom here on earth. Help us, O Lord, to keep Jesus first in our lives. You know, to, to seek after you uh, each morning in prayer and scripture when we feel like it and we don't. To, to reach out to, to you know, folks at work, at school, and neighborhood, family, all around us when we feel like we don't have any more energy left to spread around to care about anybody else. God, help us to do it, realizing that your kingdom, your intention is that your kingdom grow here on earth and that we may feel like a small part, but it's a big deal. Big things happen as we allow you to work through us. Have your good way in us, we pray. For your glory, for the blessing of many, for the growth of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand please. Amen.
So whether you come from the south or the north, however you come in here, you can see those every Sunday you come. I hope you make a point of looking at those. May God remind you and me that He, you know, brings about this growth in His kingdom that's beyond what we can imagine. Just like He does growth in the sea. May that encourage you. God use that to encourage you. Stay at it. Keep, keep, uh, you know, being a part of His kingdom and, and not giving up. He's doing great things, bigger things than you could ever imagine through your life and your witness. Have a great week.